pleased to welcome Jean-Paul Lalouche, who is a Director de Recherche Emerite at the CNRS. And um, he'll be speaking to us about hidden automatic sequences. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Jeff. And thanks uh, to Narad who convinced me to give a talk here. Mm, so the title is Hidden Automatic Sequences. And this is actually a joint work with Michel de King and Martin Kefelec. And there is a paper on archive. You can see the reference just uh, below. Okay, so I guess I have to say a little bit of things about uh, morphism and so on and so forth. Of course, I guess that almost everybody knows about that, but um, I feel obliged to make some, some reminders on that. Okay, if I succeed, okay. So, as you know, a finite set in this context is called an alphabet. The elements of these sets are called letters. The set of words is a set of finite sequences on this alphabet, and it's uh, uh, denoted by a star and is equipped with the concatenation rule, making this uh, set A star a monoid, actually a free monoid. The length of a word is the total number of its letters, uh, with the empty word having length zero by convention, by definition. And now, if you have two uh, alphabets A and B, and you look at the monoids A star and B star, a morphism, just a map that preserves concatenation, as usual, when you have a, 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 a structure, a morphism is just something that conserves the structure. And it's, it's of course, determined by its values on the uh, alphabet you started from. And it's called uniform or of constant lengths if all the images of letters have the same lengths. And if this length is L, it's called L uniform or of constant lengths L. Okay, now uh, suppose that you have the same alphabet A and B, A equal B, and you have a morphism from A star to itself. And suppose that the morphism is phi, and there exists a letter A such that phi of A begins with A, and such that the length of the iterates of phi on, on the letter A, phi k of A, tends to infinity with k. So the sequence phi k of A tends to an infinite sequence that is somehow a limit for a natural topology, which is topology of simple conversions. And it's it's a fixed point of phi, actually not exactly of phi, but of the extension of phi to the infinite sequences. In extension, just what you get, what you guess, and it can be, um, it's, it's an extension by continuity, actually, if you take this topology. And it's called sometimes also an iterative fixed point to insist on the fact that you obtain it by just iterating phi on A. When you have this iterative fixed point, this is it's called a purely morphic sequence, so just a fixed point of the of the morphism of the iteration. And two very well known examples is I will find the two more sequence where the alphabet is zero one, morphism is zero goes to zero one and one goes to one zero. And if you iterate on say zero, you get those words uh, zero zero one and so on and so forth. And finally. Uh, the famous two more sequence. Another famous sequence is binary Fibonacci sequence, same alphabet you start from, and morphism is a little bit different. So zero goes to zero, one, one goes to zero, and then we iterate on zero. And finally, what I need to uh, recall is what is called the morphic sequence. So essentially, you have a purely morphic sequence, and then you take the letterwise, pointwise image by some map. Uh, more precisely, you have an alphabet above, say B, a morphism on B, a fixed iterative fixed point on a B star that you call the sequence B sub N. And you have a map from B to A and you just take the image of B N to, to by F to obtain A sub N. If this morphism phi you started from in this uh, context has length L, constant length L, then the sequence is called L automatic or sometimes uh, L uniform, uh, L uniformly morphic. Anyway, we say like aromatic. Okay, uh, last example, which is a Godet Shapiro sequence, sometimes called the Rudin Shapiro sequence. It's a two automatic sequence defined as follows. The alphabet up, upstairs is, uh, I mean, the alphabet is zero one, the auxiliary alphabet, the auxiliary, the alphabet upstairs is A, B, C, D. You have this morphism, A goes to A, B, B goes to A, C, C goes to D, B, and D goes to D, C, D. You take the fixed point beginning with A, and you replace every A by a, and B by a zero, and every C and D by a one, and you get the Godet Shapiro sequence. Uh, okay, maybe, 
maybe maybe I should say, but you certainly know that because uh, I probably already told it told that many times. Uh, it should be called the Gaulle Shapiro sequence and not the Rudin Shapiro sequence. Uh, I mean, I feel guilty about that because I am one of those people who repeated that Rudin and Shapiro discovered the sequence independently, which is totally wrong uh, because Shapiro uh, proposed the sequence in his master thesis and also in his PhD thesis, and Rudin was sitting on both committees. Actually, there is even a, a, an acknowledgement of priority by, by Rudin. Uh, though Gollet was working in a completely different field, in radars, and he found his sequence the same year as Shapiro. He found uh, the Gollet Shapiro sequence. Anyway, of course, a general morphic sequence has no reason to be L automatic, whatever LB is. Uh, for example, it's easy to prove that binary Fibonacci sequence that I defined just before is not L automatic, whatever L uh, is. And why? Of course, you, you know that very well. Uh, the frequencies of letters are not rational. They do exist and they are not rational. Okay. Now, let me uh, uh, say something about the origin of the problem. Beginning of the story. It was uh, in 2011. Uh, Martin Kifelek and myself worked on the Lysenok morphism, uh, and uh, this morphism is defined by A goes to A, C, A, B goes to D, C goes to B, and D goes to C, and when we work on that, we uh, found that this morphism, I mean, it's not a big deal, it's just, you just write it and that's it, the morphism is too automatic once you, once you want to prove it and once you have the morphism, it's just a matter of a few lines to prove it. Uh, now, we, we were discouraged somehow to publish. I mean, it was not just this morphine. We are studying what is called the Grigor Schub, Grigor Schub group, the first Grigor Schub group. And this morphine was occurring uh, when studying this group and so on and so forth. So uh, we were explained that our morphine did not reveal the algebraic properties of the group, whatever. And so we just keep that unpublished. But funny was this was just done again in a paper by Gregor Schuklans and Nagni Beda about this group precisely. And with this morphism they found again that the morphism is too automatic. Uh, yeah, the uh, listener morphism actually provides a presentation by generators and relations of the first Gregor Schuk group. I am speaking about this thing a little bit later on. Uh, the number of defining relations in, in, is infinite, but that's not a big deal. Okay. And so when we looked at that, the question was whether previous examples could be found in the literature on, on, on this. I mean, fixed point of non uniformity that happened to be actually L automatic for some L. And yes, the answer is yes. For example, Berstel in, in the 70s, at the end of the 70s, proved that some well known square free sequence, which is the Israel sequence, which is a fixed point of this morphism, zero goes to one, two, one goes to one, zero, two, and two, two goes to zero, is actually an automatic sequence. You take this morphism, zero goes to one, two, one goes to one, three, and so on and so forth, and you take the reduction, reduction module three of this morphism, and you obtain exactly the same sequence. Actually, another, I mean, other examples were given also by Deking in 78, uh, we are going to speak about that also a little bit later. Mm. Yeah, okay. Then we began to play with some examples of morphic sequences and the source of such examples is uh, the uh, online encyclopedia of integer sequence, the OEIS. And for example, if you look at this morphism psi, given the psi of zero equals zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, and C1 equals zero, one, uh, you play with that, and if you look at psi of zero one and psi of one zero, you get, of course, two words of the same length, evidently. And furthermore, if you define two auxiliary words zero one and one zero, say W1 and W2, what you get is, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that psi of W1 is 
some something in Ws and the same for the other one. Now you just make a trick, you change the alphabet, you define a new alphabet, just putting a prime and a new morphism that putting a prime. And it's clear that the fixed point of psi is the image of the fixed point of psi prime beginning with W prime one, when you replace those primes, but by the words they, uh, they were inspired by. So you replace W prime one by zero one, W prime two by one zero. And then you obtain immediately that the fixed point of psi is four automatic, hence two automatic. Okay, I'm kind of. Um, yeah, when you when you make this replacement, W prime one by zero one and W prime two by one two, it means that you essentially look at the odd and I mean the even and odd indexes, and you have a sequence where you shuffle somehow, perfectly shuffle odd and even, and if every one is every of those two sequences, each of those two sequences is uh, two automatic. So when you just shuffle it perfectly, it gives of course, a two-dimensional sequence. So what was so special with this morphism? What was so special is you could decompose psi of zero and psi of one into words that happen to be anagrams of each other. So trying to make this idea a little bit more precise, you obtain this anagram theorem. So you have your alphabet, A. You have a finite set W, which is a finite set of anagrams on the alphabet A. And you have a morphism psi, admitting an infinite fixed point and so on and so forth. And such that the image by, the image by psi of any letter in A is obtained by a concatenation of words in this W finite set of anagrams. Then the fixed point is D automatic, where D is the length of psi of W divided by the length of W. And of course, it doesn't depend on W by the hypothesis, which is exactly what we did uh, in, this, uh, in this example. Huh? Okay, so we have this anagram theorem, which has uh, an interest. It you can apply it essentially in a visual manner. Like visually, we are going to see that it's, there is a more ancient, more general theorem. But let's stick to this anagram theorem for the moment. Uh, and for example, if you look at the sequence eight, twenty-eight, forty-eight, seventy, seventy-eight uh, in the uh, encyclopedia of digital sequences defined as a fixed point of this, morph this morphism, zero goes to zero, one, one goes to zero, one, one, zero. Uh, it's not a big deal, just applying the anagram theorem to show that it's actually three automatic and not only just morphic, mm -hmm, purely morphic. And the, the double set of anagrams here is zero, one, and one, zero as previously. And if you do the same job with other sequences, for example, 28, 49, 5, 28, 50, 53, 5, 28, 49, 12, and probably others, uh, you get the same thing. And the second slightly different example is 28, 50 to 49, which is defined that the limiting root of the morphism zero goes to one, zero, one goes to zero, one, zero, one, which means you take the square of the morphism and the fixed point beginning with zero, and you obtain something by the same anagram theorem, which is actually nine automatic, hence three automatic, of course. Good. So everything is okay right now? Can you carry on? Okay. Uh, yeah, at, at this point, we remember uh, an old, I mean, an ancient theorem of decking at the end of the 70s, again, 1978, which appeared in Zeitschrift of Wahrscheinlichkeitstheorie und Verwandte Gebiete. And it was probably too difficult to pronounce, so the name changed in the last uh, decades. and. It's now called probability theory and rated fields. And the theorem is as follows. You have a morphism on the alphabet zero up to R minus, R minus one. You suppose that phi is non-erasing, which means that no later goes to the empty word. Uh, you suppose that phi admits an iterative fixed point. You call this sequence A sub N. And you, 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 you call L of I the length of the word psi, phi of i, phi is a morphism, and you look at the vector L0, L1, L R minus one, if this vector is a left eigenvector of the incidence matrix, transition matrix of phi, then the sequence A, N is Q automatic, where Q is exactly the spectral radius of M. Okay, so if you, you, you have your morphism, you have uh, an entirely fixed point, and you have some property of the length of the uh, 
images of each layer. And this probability just to be a left eigenvector of the incidence matrix. And then the sequence is automatic. And furthermore, it's, it's Q automatic, where Q is the maximal uh, eigenvalue of the spectral radius. Good. Exercise. Prove that the anagram theorem is actually a particular case of the theorem of decaying above. It's not a big deal. The, the only advantage of the anagram theorem is that, as I said previously, it's sort of visual. I mean, you can look at what, what's going on. You, you see immediately uh, what is your, your uh, whether the conditions are, are failed. Good. Of course, decaying theorem is stronger. I forgot to say that. For example, if you look at the fixed point of zero goes to zero uh, to one zero and one goes to one one zero zero, then you get something that uh, uh, is free automatic. Yeah, uh, I see a, a, a question on the on, in the chat. Yes, Q is an integer. Uh, that that is a consequence of the of the King's paper, if I'm not mistaken. But that's a good question. Actually, you're right. It could well be that if you take it any matrix, uh, then you get, of course, something which is not an integer, even a positive matrix. But in this case, uh, you've. Okay. Yeah, uh, Pierre Arnoux is right. It's exactly the reason why uh, we get a, a, an an integer for Q. Okay, now I'm speaking a little bit, but a very little bit about self-similar groups. I don't want to enter into, into details about that. And I'm just uh, giving two quotes from the book of Nikrashevich in 2005 called Self-Similar Groups, precisely. So the first quotation is uh, the following one. Self-similar groups are also called groups generated by Automata. And uh, goes back to the early 80s. And the point is, it's a way of constructing groups that have interesting properties, exotic properties, non-trivial properties, um, with a very simple construction, which essentially consists of looking at morphisms. And uh, those morphisms describe, as I said previously, uh, relations uh, on the alphabet of generators of the group, the group with finitely generated. And he gives an, uh, the same introduction. Uh, Nekrashevich gives uh, uh, an example, the Grigorsch group, now called the first Grigorsch group. It can be defined as a group defined by an automaton with five states on an alphabet on two letters. And this gives a particular simple example of an infin infin infinite finitely generated torsion group. And it's the first example of a group whose growth is intermediate between polynomial and exponential. So very uh, important in the theory of group of these kinds of groups. And again, essentially, those groups are constructed via morphism. Simple construction and something complicated. And this is sort of a motto of, of a fixed point of morphism. I mean, you've always, almost always, very simple construction and something completely not trivial uh, when you apply this construction at something uh, different, something else. Uh, yeah, those self similar groups are also called automata groups. And it should be uh, told here that automata groups and automatic groups are something different. In particular, uh, I never succeeded in finding any use of automatic sequences in automatic groups versus this is the case for automata groups, whatever. Good. It happens that some fixed point of non constraint morphisms, which, are, which we are used to construct those self similar groups, happen to be automatic. For example, we have seen the Wissenhoek morphism A goes to A, C, A, B, D goes to D, C goes to B, D goes to C, which is actually the fixed point is too automatic. But if you look at it a bit in the literature, you find another uh, group studied by Bartholdi and Gregorschuk, two names in this uh, theory of automata groups. Uh, which is not very different from the first one, but it's different still. You, I mean, the B is somewhere uh, later, earlier in the, in the process. And I found also in the PhD thesis of Muntian, a uh, slightly simpler example where he takes the 
uh, morphism A goes to A, B, A, B, B goes to C, C goes to B, which is again too automatic. And I forgot to say, but it's clear from the from the statement that this is not a consequence of the anagram theorem, uh, but of the uh, uh, Deking result theorem. Okay. And then two natural equations arise, at least two. So the first one is um, are there self similar groups defined by morphisms whose fixed points are not automatic? Oh, yes. And question, question number two uh, we, we've just seen that some, some fixed points of non constant morphisms are automatic. Suppose we take all these non constant morphisms giving uh, rise to automatic sequences, which class or subclass of automatic sequences do we obtain? And I'm twisting a little bit this question, question number two. In question number two prime, sure. instead of looking at fixed point of non constant stacks, I just look at non-uniform morphic sequences. So, I mean, there's probably a problem of terminology because if you say that the sequence is non-uniform morphic, it means for me that it's not given by uniform morphism. It doesn't mean that it, there is no uniform morphism that can give it. So, I mean, terminology is slightly ambiguous. Okay, anyway, the question two prime is some, what are the non uniform, sorry, what are the automatic sequences that can be obtained also in a non uniform way? Okay. So for the first question, are there self similar groups defined by morphisms who, whose fixed points are not automatic? The answer is, of course, yes. I mean, it was clearly a chance. I mean, some sort of thing, unexpected, unexpected thing to get something which was uh, automatic. And if you look at our paper on archive, we will find a bunch of examples that are not automatic, which actually raises another question how to prove that a non-uniform morphic sequence is automatic. So you have a morphic sequence given by a morphism which is not uniform and you want to prove that it's automatic or it's not automatic, what kind of tools do you have? Uh, okay, and the paper in preparation by Jeff and me on that, where we try to gather as many examples as possible and as many methods as possible. So the question number two prime, which was again, you have a sequence given by morphism plus projection and the morphism is not uniform. And you suppose that the result is automatic. And if you look at all the automatic sequences obtained this way, what kind of automatic sequence do you obtain? Answer, possibly unexpected. Oops, you get all automatic sequences. That's sort of unexpected, which means that somehow, the automatic sequences are a subclass on the non uniform morphic sequences. In the sense that I say non uniform morphic, just saying that they, were, they are given by something that is not uh, uniform. And this is a result by Jeff and myself, recently appeared in a, uh, a book edited by Regorski and Rassias called Discrete Mathematics and Applications, where we prove uh, it's, the paper is available in archive again and where we prove that any automatic sequence is also non-uniform morphic. So give me an automatic sequence and I can do, I can even do that via an algorithm, explicit algorithm. Uh, I can build, construct a non-uniform morphism and a projection such that the projection of the fixed point of the non-uniform morphism is uh, the sequence you started from, the automatic sequence you started from. Hmm? Uh, of course, I'm not going to prove that, but I'm just going to give you an example with the two more sequence. I proved that the two more sequence in non-uniform morphic uh, and probably looking at this example and doing some sort of reverse engineering, you can, you can guess the proof, the general proof and reconstruct the general proof. Okay, caveat. Of course, when I want to write the two more sequence as a fixed point of something non-uniform, it was told to us by Mendes France, uh, of course, this would be cheating. I mean, 
taking zero goes to zero one, one goes one zero, and two goes to whatever, with only zeros and ones is of course cheating because, okay, because it's cheating. cheating. Uh, so the idea for the two more sequence as follows, you, you start from a, a power of, of the two morph, morphism, namely here the power three, uh, power depends on the example, but it can be of course uh, decided. <clears throat> so yeah, zero goes to zero one, one zero one zero zero one, and one goes to the uh, thing that it should go to. This is the first step. Second step, split gamma of zero one into two words, Z and T, such that the concatenation of Z and, and of Z and T gives gamma of zero one. And the concatenation is whatever you want, except that you want the lengths of Z and T to be different. Of course, you have plenty of choices, plenty of choices. Now you define a new morphism on a new alphabet. In this case, four letters, zero, one, B, C. And you define delta on Z of zero is zero, one, one, B, C, zero, zero, one. Delta of one is just gamma of one. B goes to Z and C goes to T. Okay, now you just have to check the following. If you take the limit of delta k of zero, so you just iterate delta on zero, you obtain some sequence on the four letter alphabet, and then you just project everything. So zero goes to uh, zero, one goes to one, B goes to zero, zero, and C goes to one. It's not a big deal to see that you get indeed the two more sequence. So you just obtain it as a something which is which has non-constant things because remember Z and T had different lengths. Uh, now generalize, as I said, some sort of reverse engineering uh, make the thing not that difficult. Thank you. Actually, this was the first part of the talk. Uh, remember at some point I said, uh, there was a question number two prime in the bottom of the, of the slide, which was uh, to prove that some sequences that are non, that are given by non uniform morphism uh, are automatic and the question was, what kind of automatic sequences you, you obtain this way? And so my thank you was the wrong thank you. I mean, an early thank you. In case I would have been late, but it's not the case. Okay. How do you prove that a given sequence is not automatic? To uh, restrict the question a little bit, I'm not taking any sequence, but a sequence given by morphism. Some of the of the methods I'm going to, to to tell about are actually work for for any sequence, but it's even better for uh, morphic sequences. So you remember what the kernel of a sequence is? So the Q kernel is just the um, subsequences on uh, arithmetic progressions of ratio Q to the K. And you know that the sequence is Q automatic if and only if this it's the Q kernel of sequence is finite. So if you prove that the Q kernel is infinite, uh, you are done, of course. And the difficulty is to find out uh, a number of sequence, an infinite, an infinite number of sequences in this kernel. And so the kernel again is is composed of sequences of the kind. Uh, if U is a sequence, you started from U sub two K n plus J, where J is smaller than two to the K. But of course, you can make J depend on K. For example, if you look at this, A goes to A, A, B, and B goes to B, uh, uh, you take the subsequence defined as follows. V sub N is U sub two to the K N plus two to the K minus K. So the J is two to the K minus K here. And you prove, you can prove that you get this way an infinite number of sequences, which imply, which implies that the, the uh, fixed point of this morphism is not too automatic, okay? Mm, I will say a little bit later why it is not Q automatic for any other Q, but the difficulty is for Q equal to, and it was done in a paper by, if I'm not mistaken, by uh, Betrema, Shalit, and myself. And I think that Jeff had the idea of looking at those sequences after making uh, crazy computations. And of course, once you have the thing, uh, <clears throat> the difficulty is to find the thing. I mean, it's not trivial to prove that you get precisely an infinite uh, set of sequences, but at least you, you have something to, to grasp. 
on. Uh, I forgot to say that this works. Uh, this is this was a source of uh, transcendence of the formal series pi in positive characteristic, and there's something on the same on the same uh, in the same spirit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I said. Uh, crazy computations, of course, they are not that crazy because it was oriented computation and Jeff knew exactly what, what he wanted to do. So maybe I should say, I should say clever computations. Huh? Uh, okay. Uh, so the second uh, way of proving the sequence in automatic is look at frequencies. For example, I mentioned previously this Fibonacci sequence and the uh, frequencies of letters are related to the golden ratio. And so they cannot be, it cannot be an automatic sequence. Actually, we can do even a little bit more precise, I mean, more general, sorry. Uh, instead of letters, you can look at words. Uh, it's not a big deal to see that the uh, occurrence of words in an automatic sequence give also an automatic sequence, so that if you have a word whose frequency is irrational, that gives you that sequence is not automatic. It was, for example, used in uh, something that I, I made years ago on the uh, cyclic ha Hanoi Tower, I mean, you have an algorithm, you have an infinite sequence of moves that permit to, uh, that allows you to, 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 to finish the puzzle. The Hanoi puzzle in case you have a cyclic uh, uh, Hanoi puzzle. And um, you can show if I'm not, if I remember well, some words of length three or four, maybe three, has a, occurs with an irrational frequency. And actually, it's also used in other variations of uh, design of towers, but I'm not speaking about that. Now, you, you can also look at the black complexity. And for example, the black complexity in one dimension of an atomic sequence, the number of lengths of, of blocks of subworlds of factors of lengths n is big O of n. So if you get something uh, larger than the big O of n, of course, you have something which is not automatic. Same thing can work in uh, several dimensions for automatic sequences in two, three, four, whatever dimension. And for example, if you take the Pascal triangle mod D, it was proved by, if I remember well, by Valérie Bertin and myself, that you get something which is automatic, sorry, two, uh, which is D automatic in two dimensions, if and only if D is a, a prime power. And in, for example, mod four, mod eight, mod, but for example, for D equals six, you get something that is not automatic. And there the, the are like two papers with my colleagues from Bremen, Bidgen, Skodev, uh, and others, uh, making the same kind of things in the case of a serial automaton, linear serial automaton, you look at the uh, two dimension uh, thing obtained when you, when you take the evolution, the time evolution of the uh, one dimensional linear cellular automaton. Okay, you can also look at the uh, characteristic function of an increasing sequence of integers, and you look at the growth of the sequence, or the gaps that occur, that occur, and so on and so forth. So for example, it's well known, it's an older res result, that the characteristic, characteristic function of primes is not the automatic, whatever the D is. Um, yeah, Dirichlet like series. If you take a sequence, say values plus or minus one, and you look at Dirichlet series summation of minus one uh, of epsilon and epsilon in this sequence divided by n to the s, you can ask uh, what the the, pro the properties, I mean the analytic properties of the uh, complex function you obtain are, and it happens there is a, a result by uh, Henri Cohen and myself for the Moore sequence. Uh, uh, from a result by Mendes, France, Perrier, and myself for more general sequences, for the automatic sequences in general, uh, that the poles, I mean, you take, you take a Dirichlet series whose coefficients are automatic. First, it can be extended, extended to a meromorphic uh, function on the whole complex plane. It's even an entire function in the case of the two more sequence, in general, just meromorphic. And the location of the poles, if any, of the candidates to be poles uh, is exactly a finite union of left semi lattice on the left. 
whatever this means. So if you have a Dirichlet series such that those uh, the possible poles, I mean, Dirichlet poles are not on this form, are not on, on this finite uh, union of, uh, infinite, of infinite uh, left lattices, it cannot be the sequence of coefficients, cannot be automatic. It was used, for example, by uh, my former student, um, Yining Hu. And there's also a very nice paper by Kuhns where he proved that many series, many so, sorry, sequences are not many, arithmetic sequences are not automatic, um, just by looking at Dirichlet series and using deep results on these Dirichlet series, deep analytic results on these Dirichlet series, on the poles on these Dirichlet series. You can look also at the orbit properties. Uh, you can ask Jeff about anything concerning orbit properties. For example, uh, something that I like very much is a uh, result by Fabien Durand, which is a generalization of a theorem by Cobham. Uh, so you remember, you may remember that Cobham theorem say the following, if you have a sequence that is both two automatic and three automatic, then it must be periodic or at least periodic from some point on, I mean, ultimately peri eventually periodic, okay? Now, if you take a sequence which is morphic, so you have a morphism and then you take the image, letter wise image of the fixed point of this morphism, the uh, dominant eigenvalues, or spectral radius, if you want, of the, mat of the matrix of morphism above uh, plays essentially the same role as two when I say two automatic, okay? So the result of Fabien is you have two morphic sequences and the, uh, dominant eigenvalue above for the first one and dominant value above for the second one are multiplicative, multiplicatively independent. If, you, if the same sequence is generated in those two ways, then it must be periodic from some point on. Okay, for example, you remember this example at the, the top of the slide, A goes to A, A, B, B goes to B. So if I'm not mistaken, the dominant eigenvalue is equal to two, so that any Q, which is not a power of two, any integer Q, which is not a power of two, is multiplicatively independent of Q, so that you can, with this theorem of Durand, Fabien Durand, uh, state that this sequence is not Q automatic, whatever Q is different from power of two. So that if you want to prove it is not automatic at all, you have just to look at the powers of two, and hence you have just to look at two. Okay, this is a fantastic result that uh, it's interesting because Fabien had a, several subcases. He had to suppose that something was primitive and something was minimal, whatever, and so on and so forth. And finally, he got the, the, the D, uh, final result, which is extremely useful in this, in this, uh, in this period. I mean, extremely useful, but of course, going back to the first example that uh, wipes out uh, almost all things. And of course, what remains in this case, uh, the question of two automaticity is usually difficult and needs some sort of clever clever trick or clever, clever idea. And of course, there are a lot of different ideas. And I thought I could stop there and wait for your questions uh, that I welcome. Thank you, this one is a second thank you. <laughs> okay, let's thank uh, Jean-Paul for his uh, talk and uh, open up uh, the floor to any questions. You can either type something in the chat or uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. So there's a question from Dan Rust. Uh, it says, for your question two prime, had you considered using return word encodings as another method of producing non-uniform morphisms? I feel like that might be another approach. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually we thought of that, but as far as I know, we don't have any example, I mean, any working example yet, which cannot be done uh, in a different way. Uh, has to, I have to check uh, this precisely, uh, but this is certainly a very good idea, uh, which goes farther, I mean, which goes in another direction uh, than the one I suggested at 
looking at words uh, occurring. There is not just words occurring, it's just the uh, returns of I mean, return words. So that's a very good question. And for the moment, we have no, as far as I remember, we have no example that, that goes into this, but this is certainly to consider. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Jason yeah. Bell. Do you want to read it? Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you. The fact that Giga group is a two group related to the system morphic would be too automatic. Uh, another good question. Uh, I must say, I don't know, but I'm almost, I would say probably not related. I mean, the, I would say not related, but I'm not, I'm not positive on that. Uh, it could well be. I, I don't even really see why this should be. Okay, so the best answer is I don't know. I suspect no, but I don't know really. Another good question. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, uh, hearing no other questions, let's thank Jean-Paul again. And um, let me um, mention a few things related to this uh, online seminar. Um, so today we had uh, 77 people attending the talk, which I believe is a new record. I don't think we've ever had that many people before. So 